first ever webinar for uh, Miller Review Course and OrthoBullets. My special thanks to, uh, to the OrthoBullets team for their outstanding participation, and especially Derek Moore, who's the uh, founder of OrthoBullets. So tonight, we'd like to review some highlights of sports medicine, a top 10 list. I'd like to recognize and thank Winston Guafme, who created these uh, slides in large part. And uh, he got 100% in his OITE, so it's particularly uh, impressive that he's able to participate in this with us. My conflicts of interest are here. Most of them are educational in uh, concept. So in order to create a lecture like this, it requires a great deal of preparation, a lot of review of other OITE exams and self-assessment exams. Various textbooks include many that I've authored. And so I appreciate uh, you have uh, participated in that, and I participate those who have purchased those books and studied those books. Because we're all studying these things, it's a concept of lifelong learning. And so the review book, the sixth edition, is coming out very, very soon, within weeks. And I've even participated also with the Academy review text. So we're going to do this in a top 10 approach starting with the lowest number 10, which is a medical condition, not surprisingly, and going up to number one, which is ACL reconstruction, which is the top tested exam topic on both the OITE and the boards. So here we go. Concussion, this has changed in recent years because uh, we've realized that uh, you should not return to play at all after you have a concussion during that game. And that return to play requires you to be symptom free with exertion, that loss of consciousness is not required, and that we need to be more vigilant with second impact syndrome, which is when a second athlete gets hurt a second time after already having a baseline concussion. And so those are the key concepts uh, with concussion. Again, out for a week, skilled assessment prior to return to play. Moving on to medical conditions, the burner or stinger. Here, the patient can return to play the same day, but only after their symptoms resolve, the dead arm syndrome resolves, and they have good strength in both extremities and normal range of motion of their neck. If their symptoms persist, they should have a C-spine evaluation at a later date. Another medical condition that's commonly tested is hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. This is the number one cause of sudden death in young athletes. This is an absolute contraindication to participation. The problem is diagnosing this, and it often requires an echo. However, if you have a grade 2 to 4 systolic ejection murmur that increases with Valsalva, you should probably be uh, very concerned about this possibility. And this is often asked on examinations. The final medical conditions is often asked is the female athlete triad. This includes amenorrhea, disordered eating, and osteoporosis. And therefore, you should know that triad because that in itself is often a test examination. Moving on now to sports elbow, which is number nine in the hit list. The key here is the ulnar collateral ligament. This ligament is tested almost as much as the ACL. The key here is to understand that the anterior band of this ligament is the key structure. It is uh, important to reconstruct this in throwing athletes. You should also recommend recognize that this is an isometric portion of the ligament that stays the same length in extension and flexion. Moving on to the distal biceps, this can have partial tears. If the partial tear occurs, it's on the radial side, you should do an approach that risks, uh, the, reduce, reduce the risk to the lateral antibracutaneous nerve. This anterior approach does that. On the other hand, if you do a two incision technique, it increases the risk of synostosis. Those concepts are often tested. Little Leaguer's elbow involves an injury to the physis, and this is treated by rest. The same thing with elbow OCD, which involves the capitellum. This should be treated with rest as well. Unless the lesion is unstable, then it must be fixed or excised. 
Double arthroscopy, like most things on the in-training and the board exams, is highly testable because there's a lot of neurovascular structures around the elbow. For that reason, they like to worry about portals and the associated risk with various nervous structures. For example, the anterior lateral approach risks the lateral anterior cutaneous nerve and the radial nerve. The anterior medial portal risks the medial anterior cutaneous nerves and the median nerve, and the proximal medial portal risks the ulnar nerve. And therefore, those should be memorized because they're often tested on examinations. Let's move on then to number eight: exercise and rehab. Here we have to concern ourselves with the types of rehab, isotonic, isometric, isokinetic, and plyometric. Just understanding these concepts can often earn you a correct answer on the exam. And then what's very commonly tested is the concept of open versus closed chain. So in addition to these concepts of exercise, realize that an open chain involves an extremity that's not fixed, and a closed chain involves an extremity that's fixed. So open chain exercise increase joint reactive force, and therefore they're contraindicated in early rehab, such as for ACLs. Let's move on to thrower's shoulder. Here we realize that the anatomy is important and often tested, and of course, one of the key structures is the inferior glenohumeral ligament complex, especially the anterior band. The anterior band is the key restraint to anterior displacement when you're in a throwing position, and so that's often tested. Also realize that the biceps anchor is important because it attaches to the labrum, and it also is important with superior labral tears. What's often tested is the fact that this biceps can displace medially with subscap injuries. And so that's important to recognize and often will be tested. So a slap tear is various types, but type 2 is the most common. And also what's tested is this a spinoglenoid cyst can be associated with this. And this can often cause infraspinatus weakness. You should repair the type 2 in young athletes but probably do a biceps tenotomy or tenodesis in older patients. Also recognize this structure, the sublabel foramen. This is a normal anatomic structure, and, and tightening that up when it's not indicated can result in excessive loss of external rotation. Also recognize a commonly tested concept is the suprascapular nerve, which can be entrapped in two different locations in the transverse scapular ligament, which would affect both the supraspinatus and the infraspinatus, or the spinoglenoid notch, which affects only the infraspinatus. This is asked very frequently because it's a two-tier question involving both anatomy and clinical findings. Again, another test question involves the quadrangular space. Recognize that this can cause entrapment. You should ignore the borders of this space and also the fact that the posterior circumflex humeral artery accompanies the axillary nerve in that space. Glenohumeral internal rotation deficit or GERD is a very common problem in throwers. The treatment involves trying to retain that motion by working on the sleeper stretch. This is an exercise that is very common and very helpful in pitchers. You should often avoid doing any type of slap repair because that may end the athlete's career. Let's move on to number six, the meniscus. You have to recognize the meniscus is a very important structure, has a lot of roles. Note that the posterior horn of the medial meniscus is a secondary stabilizer to the ACL and that the lateral meniscus moves a lot more than the medial meniscus. Both menisci are only vascularized in their periphery and therefore repairs are more possible in that location. Medial meniscus tears amongst all comers are more common than lateral meniscus tears. However, with an associated ACL tear, the lateral meniscus tear is more common. 
You should do various examinations including joint line tenderness, the McMurray test, and then if you repair it in young patients with peripheral tears, you'll get a better result. In general, the healing is better with an associated ACL tear that you're fixing, and if you have an ACL that's deficient, you'll have a much poorer result. If you do inside-out meniscus repair, which is the gold standard, the saphenous nerve is at risk with medial approaches, and the common perineal nerve is at risk with lateral approaches. Therefore, your retractor placement is important. Meniscus transplant is not often tested on the boards. However, it's clear that grade 4 chondrosis, the sandpaper cartilage, is a risk for a transplant. Let's move on to shoulder arthroplasty. Hemiarthroplasty is good for patients with fractures. However, it can be a problem with patients that have glenohumeral arthritis. If you do a hemiarthroplasty, you need to recognize that the humeral head must be retroverted. You can do this practically by externally rotating the arm. Also, if you're doing this for a fracture, you submit the prosthesis proud, and therefore that's a guide for placing that prosthesis. A total shoulder arthroplasty is not indicated in patients with rotator cuff tear or, or uh, cuff tear arthropathy because a high riding head can loosen the glenoid. One of the most tested questions with shoulder arthroplasty is the fact that a subscap tear can occur following this because the repair is not done adequately. And this leads to a whole host of questions about subscap, including the liftoff sign, etc. Reverse shoulder arthroplasty is becoming more and more uh, common and probably is testable material. The ideal patient is an elderly patient with essentially no function but an intact deltoid. The fact that an intact deltoid is required is a very, very common test question. Let's move on to the posterior cruciate and the posterior lateral corner, one of my favorite topics. The PCL is your pal because the anterior lateral bundle is the most important. So for single to bundle ACL reconstructions, you should reconstruct the anterior lateral bundle. So the key here is to recognize that and to reconstruct that whenever possible. This is commonly caused by a blow to the proximal tibia. Sometimes they ask about the fact that the foot is plantar flexed or dorsal flexed. This is simple. Uh, geometry, if you have a plantar fixed foot, then the force vector will go to the proximal tibia and not the patella. The key exam is the posterior drawer. And recognize that chronic deficiency can lead to arthritis or increased contact pressures in both the patella femoral and medial compartments of the knee. The dial test is very common. This is a concept that's really important to understand. The point is that if you have increased rotation at only 30 degrees, you may have an isolated posterior lateral corner. However, if you had increased rotation of both 30 and 90 degrees, this, rec this uh, represents combined posterior lateral corner and PCL tear. Recognize also the relationship of the, of the lateral collateral or fibular collateral ligament and the popliteus tendon. This insertion where the popliteus is medial or deep to the LCL, anterior and distal is very, very commonly tested. By the way, this distance from here to here, from the lateral collateral ligament insertion to the popliteus insertion, Laprade has shown us that's 18.5 millimeters. On the fibula, recognize the biceps inserts posterior to the LCL. So if you do just a plain old repair, it's not as good as doing a reconstruction. So in general, when possible, you should do both a repair and a reconstruction. Also recognize that chronic injuries often require an osteotomy. This is a commonly asked question. Moving on to rotator cuff tears, number three. Rotator cuff tears involve the sits muscle, supraspinatus, infraspinatus, teres minor, and subscap. The supraspinatus is most common, of course, 
and it's often tested that the footprint width on the greater tuberosity is between 14 and 16 millimeters. It's about 3 centimeters long, but only 15 millimeters wide. And of course, these muscles are important. It's important to understand the function of those muscles and the associated deficits. Now, this is an example of impingement, and this can commonly occur with rotator cuff injuries. Recognize also that asymptomatic tears occur very commonly. In older patients, they're often very present, uh, and they may be full thickness or partial thickness based upon the um, findings. If you have patients that are, um, uh, have dislocations that are older than 40 to 50, realize they may have a rotator cuff tear, which is more important than the label injury they may have. Tear sized are based upon the, the width of the tear. Small tears are less than a centimeter. Medium tears are one to three centimeters. Large tears, three to five centimeters. And massive tears involve two, centi two tendons and are more than five centimeters in, uh, in dimension. You should repair a tear if it's more than 50% of the footprint. And you recognize that fatty atrophy is a poor prognosis especially massive retraction to the level of glenoid with, with fatty infiltration, really bad. So if you have a young patient with that, with an irreparable tear, you should consider tendon transfers. Let's go on to shoulder instability, number two. The key here is the labrum, which is the primary static stabilizer. The rotator cuff is the primary dynamic stabilizer. So with shoulder instability, the key is recurrence, and this is totally age dependent. The West Point studies have shown us that you have a very high recurrence rate in young active patients. Also a concept that's being tested more and more is the concept of the inverted pair or the bony deficiency in the inferior glenoid. If you have a defect more than 25%, you should consider a bone graft procedure in association with the repair. So traumatic posterior instability is very commonly asked also because it's often missed, especially in the emergency room. And so if you recognize the fact that you're given a patient that may have this problem and they didn't get an axillary lateral radiograph, then the test answer is get an extra imaging. Get an axillary lateral radiograph because it often was missed in the emergency room and it's critically important to get that. Multidirectional instability, the key here is this is AMBRI, as Matson has called this, atraumatic, multidirectional, bilateral, rehab, and inferior capsular shift, or nowadays capsulography, but the key is the rehab. You really need to do rehab for six months. So the bottom line is you shouldn't ever consider doing surgery in these patients, especially in the boards, unless you failed rehab for at least six months. Moving on to the final topic, number one, as I told you, is the anterior cruciate ligament. The most highly tested question in both the OIT and the board exam. The key is that the ACL resists anterior translation. It has two bundles, an anterior medial and a posterior lateral bundle. The posterior lateral bundle resists the pivot shift and the anterior medial, the drawer. And therefore, it's possible to have a single bundle injury with the various different findings. You have to be realized this is commonly associated with a non-contact pivoting injury with a pop and immediate arthrosis, hemarthrosis. The fact is, in fact, 70% of the people that show up to an emergency room with a hemarthrosis of the knee have an ACL tear. This was showed by Dale Daniels in the early 70s. There is a preponderance of injuries to the female athlete and we need to fix this by focusing on plyometrics and jump training to train them to land more properly. Segone fracture is a sign qua non of an ACL tear. Uh, this uh, is very common and commonly asked test question. Additionally, this bone bruise pattern where you have a bone bruise in the posterior lateral tibia and the middle third of the lateral femoral condyle is also highly associated with an ACL tear.
Bone graft choices are asked, but the primary thing is the patellatinin grafts have increased pain uh, anteriorly as opposed to the hamstring and other grafts. Also recognize that allografts recently have been noted to have an increased failure rate in young active patients. The footprint is important. Freddie Fu has taught us this. Now our ACLs are functioning and trying to get them lower and not as posterior in the lateral femoral condyle. In fact, tunnel malposition is the most common cause of failure. If you have a femoral tunnel that's too anterior, you're tight in flexion. Think about the PCL again. Remember I told you it was tight in flexion? The anterior lateral bundle. It's your pal. It's tight in flexion. So if you have an ACL with a tunnel too anterior, it's tight in flexion. The same concept. On ACL, we have the important thing in the frequently asked test question is the fact that open chain kinetic extension exercise actually between 0 and 30 degrees puts excessive force of the graft and therefore they should be avoided in the early post-op ACL patient. So that concludes the sports review. We have other reviews tonight. I appreciate your patience and I hope that you'll come to the Miller Review course in future years. We look forward to your attendance. Thank you. It's a real pleasure to be part of this. Uh, I think this uh, structure uh, that Mark Miller and uh, Derek have designed and with Steve's help is, is going to be very beneficial. I wish I had this when I was preparing for my boards. So uh, my format is very similar to uh, Dr. Miller's uh, and the one thing that's a little different as most of you already know hand and upper extremity is a, a lot more complicated than sports. I think I picked up sports with them by the time I was in uh, ninth or tenth grade and I was I was pretty facile in it. So again of course joking but hand and upper extremity are very is, is very uh, broad uh, topic and uh, it's hard to just give you a top 10 but I'm going to give you a teaser uh, of the uh, five hour uh, lecture that is presented at the review course. My uh, uh, partner in crime is Dr. Lance Brunton uh, who helped with these slides and helps give this presentation. He's a assistant professor at the University of Pittsburgh uh, Medical Center. So moving on uh, I would like to uh, first uh, just give some disclosures which uh, are listed and, and uh, have no conflict regarding this talk. Uh, as Dr. Miller mentioned, we have uh, uh, obtained information and reviewed extensively uh, uh, several uh, previous OIT exams and review texts uh, to come up with the uh, information in these lectures. And uh, a lot of what is in this lecture, uh, I co-authored the chapter in the, re the new edition of the review book with Dr. Brunton. Uh, so this should be a good resource for you as you prepare for the examination. So let's start. And these are in no uh, particular order, but these are very commonly tested uh, topics. Uh, and uh, just to give you an idea of the depth uh, of information you'll uh, need to know for the hand and upper extremity uh, portion of the test. And in some examinations, almost 15 to 20 percent of the exam is uh, hand and upper extremity uh, trauma and acquired conditions. So starting with anatomy, uh, you should be familiar with uh, the anatomy of the hand uh, and they ask fairly in-depth questions. So for example, the lumbricals, uh, you should know where they arise. They arise from the radial side of the FDP tendons and they pass volar to the transverse metacarpal ligament. That is a very common question and they actually are uh, the only muscle that starts volarly and contribute to the extensor mechanism. They insert on the lateral bands. So they extend the IP joints directly and indirectly through the lateral bands and they also uh, cause the uh, uh, FDP to uh, relax to allow for extension of the DIP joint and they coordinate the flexion or extensor systems. Their median and ulnar nerve innervated. The median innervates the index and long and the ulnar, the ring and small. Understand the relationship of the FDS tendons in the carpal tunnel. tunnel. Uh, you should know that the middle and ring finger are volar to uh, the index and uh, small finger in the carpal tunnel. And this relationship is important when you have a spaghetti wrist 
uh, when you have a laceration of all the flexor tendons. Uh, understanding this relationship is important when you uh, repair these tendons. Otherwise, you're going to affect uh, your uh, overall outcome. Understand the pulley system. Uh, there's five annual uh, pulleys, three cruciforms, uh, and they work together uh, to prevent bow stringing uh, through range of motion of the digit. If you lose a pulley, uh, you uh, develop a biomechanical disadvantage with a decreased joint motion and increased motion arm. The most important pulleys are the A2 and A4. They must be reconstructed uh, or repaired during a flexor tendon laceration. Otherwise, uh, you will have uh, compromise your range of motion. Some simple questions, if you know the answers, uh, on the, regarding the arterial supply of the hand. The radial artery uh, contributes to the deep palmar arch. The dorsal portion of the radial artery, as it travels through the snuff box, actually goes dorsally and, and gives off the princeps pollicis branch, uh, which supplies the index and thumb. The ulnar artery is the main contribution uh, to uh, the superficial palmar arch, uh, and in 80 Five uh, percent of people, 80 to 85 percent of people, the superficial palmar arch communicates with the deep palmar arch, and that's why you can lacerate one of the arteries and still have uh, excellent perfusion to the uh, the digit, to all the fingers. The ligaments in the digits are uh, frequently asked as well. Uh, they are often difficult to find uh, on surgical examination. You have to carefully. Uh, uh, look for these, but the volar uh, ligaments uh, and their volar to the uh, neurovascular bundle uh, are involved in dupatrins and dorsally uh, are Cleland's li ligaments and, and they're dorsal to the neurovascular bundle and they are not involved in, uh, the, uh, in, in the pathology of dupatrins disease. The artery is always dorsal to the nerve in the fingers, but the reverse is true in the palm. Uh, again, the carpal tunnel, know the anatomy in the carpal tunnel, know the uh, constituents of the, uh, what's involved in the carpal tunnel, and know that outside the carpal tunnel are the palmaris longus, the FCR, and FCU. The recurrent branch has a very vari variable course, and one question that has come up on previous exams is the fascicles to the recurrent branch of the motor nerve, where are they located in the median nerve? And they are the most volar and radial fascicles, and they tend to be the largest fascicle as well. And the importance of this is when you're repairing a median nerve, you need to line up the fascicles. And you should uh, line that accordingly where you look for the largest volar and radial fascicle because that's the recurrent motor branch. So moving on to peripheral nerve and brachial plexus. Uh, peripheral nerve lesions, uh, they present in a very uh, broad spectrum. Compressive lesions, which uh, most of you are familiar with, carpal tunnel and cubital tunnel syndrome. Stretch neuropraxias. Uh, seen with radial nerve uh, injuries with humerus fractures. There's blast injuries, crush injuries, lacerations, avulsions, and then uh, tumors can affect uh, the function of the nerve. Some key points about nerve lesions uh, is that uh, what, what are the best uh, lesions to have from a progno prognostic standpoint? And this chart shows those that the prognosis is best uh, for a nerve injury in a child when there's sharp and clean wounds, early repair, a direct repair, and a healthy, clean vascular bed. Prognosis is significantly worse when you have uh, older patients and uh, a blast or rupture uh, of, uh, the, uh, of, the, uh, of the nerve, so an injury, a blast injury to the nerve or avulsive injury to the nerve like you see in a brachial plexus, a late repair, uh, and segmental defect requiring a uh, nerve graft uh, and an infected or scarred bed. Uh, often results in a, in a poor outcome. Brachial plexus is very common uh, in terms of questions. There's very few on there, but they're fairly straightforward, and it requires you to know your anatomy. Uh, one of the more frequently tested questions are the cervical nerve root contributions to the, the main nerves in the extremity. Uh, so you should know that musculocutaneous is from the upper trunk. Uh, shoulder uh, girdle musculature is from the upper trunk as well whereas the radial and median nerves have contributions from all the, the cervical uh, nerve contributions to the brachial plexus, whereas the ulnar nerve is the lower trunk. Understanding the uh, brachial plexus anatomy is, is critical, and you might want to just look at it the night before the test uh, so it's in your short-term memory because the questions are fairly straightforward and they're all based on anatomy. Know, again, the, uh, the structure of the brachial plexus. The lateral cord uh, uh, is superficial and lateral to the axillary artery. That's why it's called the lateral cord. It gives off the lateral pectoral nerve 
the musculocutaneous and gives off a contribution to the median nerve. The medial cord is medial to the axillary artery. Uh, it gives off the medial pectoral, medial brachial cutaneous, medial anabrachial, uh, ulnar nerve and contribution to the median. Remember uh, that the lateral antebrachial cutaneous is the terminal branch of the muscular cutaneous, where the medial antebrachial cutaneous nerve comes off the brachial plexus. Posterior cord is posterior to the axillary artery. It gives off the upper and lower subscapular nerves and the thoracodorsal, which innervates the latissimus dorsi. The one key uh, testable point uh, in terms of brachial plexus anatomy is that the thoracodorsal comes off between the subscapular, the upper and lower subscapular nerve. So questions have been asked where they pointed to a nerve, uh, and it's the nerve coming off the posterior cord between two other nerves, and, and they'll ask you which nerve it is or which muscle does it innervate, and it's the thoracodorsal which innervates the latissimus dorsi. The uh, terminal uh, branches of the posterior cord are the axillary nerve uh, and the radial nerve. So moving on to uh, compression neuropathies. Uh, these are very commonly tested questions and, and what most uh, of you are familiar with. Uh, the median nerve, you should be familiar with carpal tunnel syndrome, pronator, and anterior interosseous nerve syndrome. Actually, anterior interosseous nerve syndrome is the most commonly tested of these uh, compression neuropathies. Uh, ulnar nerve, you should be familiar with cubital tunnel syndrome and Guillain's or ulnar tunnel syndrome. And then with regard to the radial nerve, uh, PIN syndrome, which is a motor uh, problem, and radial tunnel syndrome, which is a pain phenomena, and then radial sensory uh, nerve compression uh, at the wrist. So let's just focus on a few of these. Uh, carpal tunnel syndrome. Uh, when do you operate on carpal tunnel syndrome? When you have a failure of non-op management, when you have phenar weakness and atrophy, and if you have any EMG abnormalities. If you have EMG abnormalities, you have a moderate to severe carpal tunnel. So it's unlikely to improve with conservative treatment measures. Uh, you, uh, if you have a known extrinsic compression from a mass lesion, uh, which is rare in the carpal tunnel, but more common in ulnar tunnel syndrome in Guillain's Canal, uh, this should require a more urgent uh, decompression. There are cases of lipomas and ganglions uh, that cause uh, compression uh, on the median nerve at the wrist. You have the option to do open end uh, or endoscopic carpal tunnel. Uh, and, uh, and those provide uh, very good uh, results, uh, and, uh, but there is uh, differences with endoscopic uh, carpal tunnel having an earlier uh, return to work and earlier, uh, less pain uh, and higher patient satisfactions, but after three months, there's really no difference between the two techniques. Be familiar with the recurrent motor branch variations. This is a commonly tested question. And the majority of them are uh, around 80% uh, percent is uh, in figure A. But you can have uh, variations, including uh, what's seen in C, where you have uh, a transligamentous branch. And if your incision is too radial, uh, you can, as you divide the ligament, you can cut the recurrent, transligamentous uh, uh, recurrent branch. The key is to stay as on the radial side of the ring finger when you divide the transverse carpal ligament. And this is a safe zone. Anterior interosseous nerve syndrome uh, is, uh, uh, involves the main branch of the median nerve, uh, which is approximately four to six centimeters from the elbow. The AIN innervates the FPL, FDP to the index and middle, and the pronator quadratus. Uh, there's many reasons why it can be compressed. The one that, likes to, uh, that uh, is asked uh, is a Ganser's muscle, which is an accessory head of the FPL. We've seen a question where they've showed an MRI and described an anterior interosseous nerve syndrome. And they asked, and they pointed to a muscle belly, and they asked what uh, that what was the uh, cause of the AIN syndrome, and, and the answer was Ganser's muscle. The most common question uh, as to the cause of anterior osseous nerve syndrome is a viral etiology. It can occur with trauma, such as a supraconal humerus fracture, but the most common uh, presentation is a viral illness followed several days later by excruciating pain in the forearm that resolves within a few hours, and then subsequent uh, difficulty uh, in FPL and FDP to the index uh, function, as well as weakness and uh, pronation. So AIN syndrome may result in weakness or paralysis of one or more muscles. It may be confused with a tendon rupture, ill-defined forearm pain, as I mentioned, inability to flex the thumb IP or index, or make the O sign, and weak forearm pronation with the elbow inflection. Uh, Parsonage-Turner brachial neuritis 
frequently presents as an AIN palsy. So the only motor findings you will find will be an AIN palsy. Uh, but if you did an EMG on this patient, they, you, there would be more involvement of their uh, brachial plexus. They have brachial plexitis. Treatment for AIN syndrome is to rule out compression lesions, which are rare, and frequently they'll present with no FPL function. You need to make sure they don't have a tendon rupture. Um, observation is indicated. If there's no improvement in three to six months, then surgery can be done, but that's controversial. The board answer is to observe these because the majority of these that are viral-induced resolve. Cubital tunnel syndrome. Uh, is the second most common uh, entrapment uh, after carpal tunnel syndrome. You should know the points of constriction and the ones, uh, and they're listed, and these are what are released during a ulnar nerve decompression and transposition. Uh, one unusual uh, compression of, uh, site of the cubital tunnel is when there's an ankeneus epitrochlearis, which is uh, an, uh, an anatom normal anatomic variant that can cause compression of the cubital tunnel. So again, uh, it can be caused by uh, various uh, reasons, but uh, repetitive flexion of the elbow is frequent, burns or heterotopic ossification around the elbow, uh, space occupying lesions, and then of course fractures. Eons or ulnar tunnel syndrome, a common, uh, it, the board answer or questions they ask, you have to think of mass lesions. Uh, usually it's a lipoma or ganglion cyst. A uh, hook of the hamate fracture can uh, cause uh, ulnar tunnel syndrome, uh, as can ulnar artery thrombosis or aneurysms. Nerve conductions can be helpful, but if you suspect a mass lesion or someone presents with classic findings of uh, ulnar tunnel syndrome, you may want to consider an MRI uh, to, uh, to, obtain, uh, to confirm your diagnosis. I'm seeing some of the questions that are being asked, and I just want to clear up. Uh, you want to be on the ulnar side of the palm when you do your carpal tunnel wrist, you want to, but the safe zone is the radial side of the ring, ring finger, which is the ulnar aspect of the carpal tunnel. So moving on to tendon transfers, this is, uh, there are some uh, questions in this area. Uh, and they're fairly straightforward, and they almost always uh, involve the radial nerve uh, after a humerus fracture. So what is a tendon transfer? It, it's transected and reinserted into a bone or another tendon. Uh, innervation of the blood supply is preserved. The very common tendon transfer uh, that is mentioned is EIP to EPL transfer for an EPL rupture after a distal radius fracture, non-displaced distal radius fracture, or in a, rheuma, a patient with rheumatoid arthritis. These are the prerequisites for tendon transfers. You should be familiar. You can't have joint contractors and have a successful tendon transfer. Uh, you need uh, to have good tissue out equilibrium, appropriate donor mu mu uh, muscle selection, a proper direction uh, of a pull or a pulley, such as for uh, opponent's tra uh, transfer. You can't split a tendon to have it do more than one function, and you should have a donor uh, that is expendable, so you don't want to compromise the function you have to obtain uh, an additional function. Synergism is you need to think about doing a transfer that makes sense and is easy to learn. Uh, for instance, uh, when you uh, flex your wrist, uh, you should have tenodesis and finger extension. So if you can do a tendon transfer where, there's ri uh, where you use a wrist flexor to give you uh, finger extension, that's easy for someone to learn. And uh, FCR is used uh, for, e FCR transfer to EDC is, is uh, fairly easy to learn for patients. If they have sensibility, that's important because that can help with uh, uh, training and education and then you need to have a compliant uh, uh, patient. Looking at the radial nerve, uh, when you think about tendon transfers, many of them are already figured out, but if you can think about what uh, your radial nerve, uh, your nerve innervation, what muscles are, uh, are innervated by that nerve, and then the location, the level of the injury. Is it a high radial nerve palsy or a low radial nerve palsy? If it's a low radial nerve palsy, you should have wrist extension through ECRL and ECRB. So you really only need to get thumb and MCP joint extension of the fingers. However, if you have a high radial nerve injury, like you have with a humerus fracture, you need to restore wrist extension, uh, finger ex uh, MP extension, and thumb extension as well. So again, you often think about your deficits and then think about the needs. And now the deficits don't necessarily all have to be uh, restored. You really need to think about what functional needs you have because there's no way you can restore all the deficits from a nerve injury, particularly when you have uh, more than uh, one nerve that's out. If you have a medium
median and ulnar nerve injury, you only have a radial nerve, uh, you only have a, the radial nerve uh, innervated muscles to transfer, and it, you don't have a lot of expendable donors in those scenarios. So think about the functions you need to restore. So the most common radial nerve transfer is the brand transfer, transfer which uses the FCR for the, to EDC for finger extension. And the others are similar. You need pro, you use pronator teres to ECRB. So you can take pronator teres because pronator quadratus is working. You don't lose pronation. And transfer to the ECRB gives you wrist extension. You can take FCR because your FCU is still intact if you have an isolated radial nerve injury and your median and ulnar nerves are intact. And, that, and you can restore uh, finger extension in that manner. And palmaris longus can be used uh, to restore EPL uh, function uh, um, and without uh, compromising uh, any uh, current function. So here's a picture just for clarification, pronator teres to ECRB. And palmaris longus to EPL, you take uh, EPL out uh, of its uh, compartment and reroute it to the palmaris longus. And then FCR to EDC. And it's a synergistic transfer because people are, you can, tenodesis allows for wrist flexion and finger extension simultaneously. So moving on to uh, compartment syndrome, another very uh, commonly tested uh, area that you uh, should be really give me questions because they're fairly straightforward. You should know that com uh, compartment syndrome uh, runs along a spectrum. You can have acute compartment syndrome, which is a surgical emergency. And then if you miss a compartment syndrome, you have a Volkman's ischemic contracture. So what is compartment syndrome? It's increased tissue fluid pressure within an enclosed fascial muscle compartment, which decreases capillary blood flow below thresholds for tissue perfusion. Uh, if you delay the diagnosis or miss the diagnosis, you have irreversible muscle or nerve injury secondary to prolonged ischemia, and all of you know this is an absolute emergency. There's, four compart there's three compartments in the forearm, uh, and remember the deeper compartments sustain the highest pressure and the greatest amount of muscle injury. So the bolder deep compartments are the ones that are affected in early uh, compartment syndrome, and as it becomes, if the, the di diagnosis is delayed, then you have your extensors or your more uh, dorsal uh, superficial muscles affected. So when you do form compartment releases, you want to release the volar, dorsal, and mobile wide. The hand, there's some controversy about this, and I'm sure this, there'll be questions too. There's, is there nine compartments, ten compartments? The most recent literature shows there's ten compartments that should be released. The carpal tunnel is not considered a compartment, but should be released in a hand compartment syndrome. Syndrome, you have the thenar complete compartment, the hypothenar compartment, and then the separate seven interosseous compartments, as well as the adductor pollicis, which is a separate compartment. So those are the ten compartments that should be released. So remember, uh, compartment syndrome is based on physical exam. Uh, tense compartments, pain with passive extension, pain out of proportion, paresthesias, weakness, and pulses intact until late stages. So the pulse, if you lose pulses, that is the absolute end uh, stage of compartment syndrome and you've missed the boat. Uh, and they'll, by that point, they'll probably have uh, an insate, insensate extremity uh, already and, uh, and uh, uh, be moving toward a Volkman's ischemic contracture. So treatment for a compartment syndrome, uh, acute intervention is, uh, it's an orthopedic emergency, release tight dressings, fasciotomies, release all the compartments in the forearm and the hand, release the carpal tunnel, uh, and then come and bring them back when the swelling goes down for delayed skin closure or grafting and early hand therapy. What is Volkman's ischemic contracture? Results from untreated acute compartment syndrome, muscle necrosis, fibrosis, and contracture. The nerve deficits uh, uh, occur, uh, secondary to compression and fibrosis lead to chronic pain. Uh, and the progression of contracture can be for 12 months, and the end result is a contracted, painful, insensate, useless hand. So moving on to a, a, a fifth topic that is frequently asked, and that's trauma. And this is a very broad topic. And this uh, topic uh, is, uh, covers a lot of ground. I'm just going to uh, touch on the more frequently asked uh, tra trauma uh, or frequently asked injuries. Scaphoid fractures are very common. Uh, this is a, a difficult problem for all hand surgeons because most of the bone is covered by articular cartilage. Uh, 
the healing response is small, uh, is small. Uh, periosteal healing response is small, and it heals by end, end, end osteal response. It has a very tenuous blood supply, as you know, from uh, a, a retrograde fashion. Distally is more perfused than proximally, and that's why you have proximal pole uh, non-unions and AVN. It's difficult to reduce and immobilize, and a poor outcome results if it's uh, untreated, and, that, and, you, and a, snack result, a snack risk is the result. MRI is the best test for an immediate diagnosis because of high sensitivity and specificity. Bone scans also are helpful, but they don't become positive till 72 hours. When do you operate on a scaphoid fracture? Uh, if there's any displacement, and displacement means greater than a millimeter, uh, a proximal pole fracture is a surgical indication. These, in an adult, these can, should not be treated without surgery. And any angulation, and that means a humpback deformity, you uh, get uh, increased uh, DC deformity uh, resulting uh, in angulation between the scaphoid lunar, lunate articulation because of uh, collapse of the scaphoid. And any angulation is, is, is equivalent to displacement and should be treated surgically. How do you treat scaphoid fractures? Compression screws are used frequently for this. You can do it open or percutaneous. Proximal third or proximal pole fractures should be fixed. Displaced or unstable fracture, delayed presentations, meaning delayed unions or non-unions, and associated fractures of the distal radius uh, or perilunate injuries, and non-displaced fractures in high demand, high demand uh, athletes can be treated percutaneously. Hook of the hamate fractures are frequently seen on the in-training. Uh, these are in golf and racket sports. Uh, radio radiographic evaluation frequently misses this unless it's displaced. But CT scan is the best study uh, for this, and there's a picture of a CT scan with the hook of a hamate fracture. In a, in a non-baseball uh, or uh, racket uh, athlete, uh, you can treat this in a cast, but in most of the time, uh, if you have this injury, you need to excise it uh, and watch the motor branch, the ulnar nerve. ORIF is rare uh, and can lead to nerve problems, and it does not affect bat speed uh, in a, a baseball player if you take out their hook or their hamate. PIP dislocations, volar dislocations. The testable item here is when you have a volar dislocation, uh, central slip is disrupted. And if you don't treat this with extension PIP splinting, you're going to end up with a boutonniere deformity. So a frequently asked question, although clinically it's rare circumstance, uh, rarely seen is a rotatory subluxation or dislocation. That's where the central slip is intact and the condyle is buttonholed between the central slip and lateral band. It's difficult to reduce closed and frequently needs to go to the operating room for uh, open reduction. MP dislocations occur in children. There are simple dislocations and complex dislocations. They're easy to reduce. If they're simple, you can uh, easily reduce them. The complex dislocations are often irreducible because there is something entrapped in the joint, uh, and it may be the volar plate uh, or sesamoid. And if you use a volar approach to reduce these, uh, the radial digital nerve is at risk. Ways to differentiate between a complex and simple. If you look at the x-ray, you'll have parallelism, as you can see in the slide, compared to a simple. And then you may see a sesamoid in the joint, and the skin dimpling is often uh, pathognomonic for a complex dislocation. Bennett fractures are frequently asked, and the key points here is that they're unstable. They need surgical intervention. You cannot treat these closed. And because of the proximal pull of the APL, that causes uh, persistent subluxation or dislocation. So you can pin small fragments or even put a screw in larger fragments. Gamekeeper's thumb, uh, the key point is if it's incomplete, uh, it can be treated non-surgically. If it's complete, then uh, you need to treat it with surgery. And the key testable point is a stenor lesion, which is present, present in up to 80%. And the UCL is trapped by the adductor aponeurosis. Uh, as you can see, it lies on the aponeurosis and will not heal without surgical intervention. So fingertip coverage, topic four. Uh, the no tissue loss injuries or nail bed injuries. The tissue loss ones are the ones that are asked on the, uh, on the boards and in-training exams. And let's just cover a few of the common ones. VY advancement flaps are great for distal fingertip uh, uh, amputations. Uh, you can get a tension-free closure that's sensate and maintain as much length as possible. Moberg flap is what is asked about uh, thumb amputations. They're best for transverse thumb amputations. 
and it's good, it's an excellent sensate flap. Here's an example of a Moberg flap and advancement with closure. Tendon injuries. The key tendon injuries to know, again, are a central slip rupture. If you do not catch this uh, injury, uh, you will get a boutonniere deformity with time. It may not present acutely, frequently a central slip ruptures, but we, you will not have a boutonniere until the triangular, triangular ligament attenuates and the lateral bands migrate volarly, as shown on this, uh, in the schematic. The way to prevent boutonniere deformities is to diagnose the injury and ex uh, perform extension splinting if it's a closed injury of the PIP for six weeks. And if it's an open injury, repair the central slip. Know your flexor tendon anatomy uh, and know the zones of injuries and know that the uh, zone two, has, in no man's land, has the worst prognosis. What's important for flexor tendon repairs are not only the timing and incisions, but minimal touch atraumatic techniques, reduce adhesions. You want to preserve your A2 and A4 pulley, or the equivalent in the thumb is the oblique pulley. Use a core and epitendon as suture repair. Repair FDS and FDP if possible, and do an appropriate therapy protocol. The, the common flexor tendon injury that's asked is a jersey finger. What do you do with them? A zone one uh, injury, a type one injury is where the FDP is avulsed uh, back into the palm. And you should fix these acutely within seven to 10 days. If you wait too long to fix these and try to fix them, uh, you will have a quadrigia and develop a DIP contracture because you've advanced the FDP too much. Chronic injuries, you should not repair a zone a type one FDP. Uh, Otherwise, you'll end up with complications, significant complications, as mentioned above. And most people treat these without surgery or fuse the DIP joint. Uh, again, knowing the different types of zone one or jersey fingers, uh, type one should be fixed within 10 days. Type two is where it's retracted to the uh, A2 pulley uh, and can be fixed delayed up to six weeks. Type three, you have a bony fragment, as shown there. And type three is an unusual injury where you have a bony fragment, but the tendon is retracted back to the palm. No man's land, it has the worst outcome secondary to adhesions uh, at the pulleys and associated digital nerve and artery injuries. Advances in therapy have improved results, but we still have a long way to go. Uh, if you've ignored my talk up to this point, these are two, uh, this is a slide that you should pay attention uh, to, and we're almost finished here, but lumbrical plus finger is paradoxical extension of the IP joint during finger extent, finger flexion. It occurs when you have an FDP laceration or a distal fingertip amputation. What happens is the FDP retracts. Remember, the lumbrical comes off the FDP and exert, inserts on the extensor mechanism. Since there's no pull, uh, there's no uh, insertion point of the FDP, there's tension on the lumbrical, on the extensor mechanism. And when they try to flex, uh, and with no relaxation of the flexor me mechanism, it pulls on the lateral bands and extends that, that digit. It can be treated with uh, therapy or a lumbrical release, which releases the lumbricals uh, pull on the extensor mechanism. Quadrigia occurs if you advance the FDP more than a centimeter. And what happens here is since the middle ring and small finger have the same uh, common muscle belly, if you advance one of the tendons uh, and it will uh, reach its max ex excursion, the adjacent fingers, which are uninjured, will not come down fully uh, because the, the uh, maximum excursion has been uh, obtained by the tendon that was advanced. And that results in forearm pain and a weak grasp. So here's a picture of a lumbrical plus finger. And here is uh, a, uh, the quadrigia where the adjacent digits uh, to the middle finger where was the injured finger uh, has reached maximum uh, uh, flexion and you cannot uh, have uh, full uh, grip. So last two quick topics, infections, very common. Know your microbiology, Staph aureus uh, is the most common. Strep is next. Know that cat bites, uh, Pasteurella is very common in cat bites. Iconella in human bite, bites and bank uh, resistant Staph is also becoming uh, common. The frequently tested infections are herpetic whitlow, which is infection of the fingertips seen in hygienists and healthcare workers and toddlers. Uh, it, you have a prodromal symptoms along a certain uh, uh, distribution, nerve distribution. Then you get vesicular uh, uh, eruptions, which is painful, and you can see examples of this. A zinc prep is uh, needed to diagnose herpetic Whitlow. Uh, 
and it's usually self-limiting, doesn't require treatment, just observation, maybe acyclovir or antiviral, and it occurs with stress, recurs with stress and fevers. A common question is what's the most uh, frequent infection in children or toddlers, and it's herpetic whitlow. Flexertina synovitis, all of you should be familiar with. Staph aureus is the most common. Uh, you can treat ver very early infections with IV antibiotics and splinting, but the board answer will be uh, irrigation and debridement uh, of the flexor tendon sheath, e either through a limited incision closed system irrigation or through uh, open drainage. No canable signs. These are frequently asked uh, questions. Flexed, rest your, uh, flexed posture uh, of the digit, flexor uh, sheath tenderness, fusiform swelling, and pain with passive extension. Be familiar with necrotizing fasciitis. Uh, seen in IV drug users, most common gr group A beta hemolytic strep is organism, uh, and emergent aggressive IND is necessary with broad spectrum antibiotics, and the mortality rate can be quite high in immunosuppressed and older individuals. Last topic, congenital hand, where there is frequent questions, but the most common question is related to thumb hypoplasia, which is uh, part of the spectrum of radial dysplasia, failure formation or undergrowth. It's often associated with other systemic anomalies, such as bacterial, uh, uh, vertebral, anal, uh, cranial, uh, tracheoesophageal problems. So the question they tend to ask is the hypoplastic thumb. There's type 1, which is a small thumb. Type 2 is unstable MCP joint. Then type 3A and B. Type 3A, you have a hypoplastic thumb with a stable CMC joint. And type 3B, you have an unstable CMC joint. And this is the question they asked, is you can reconstruct type 1, type 2, and type 3A, but then type 3B, which is an, un, uh, an absent or unstable CMC joint, type 4, which is a pus flotant, and a type 5 is an absent thumb, uh, all should be treated with polycization. So there's an example of a polycization, moving the index finger to the place of the Thank you very much. This was just a... a, a fairly rapid sampling of a lot of the topics we cover, uh, and uh, hope it was helpful, and good luck, and hope to see many of you at the uh, Miller Review course in May. Thanks, Bobby. That was terrific. <clears throat> Just a couple of uh, questions I was uh, only sort of paying attention to there because I was told that any bone that can fit in your mouth really uh, doesn't much matter after the end of the day. I heard someone say that at some point. I can't, I can't remember who that was. <clears throat> Sir John Charnley. <laughs> I hear that from I hear that from Dr. Miller every day, but then you know he he needs me more than I need him. I can tell you that. <laughs> um, the distal radius fracture question is uh, probably very popular, probably something that will appear on the boards. What are your thoughts right now on what do you need to know in terms of uh, if you're given a patient who is a seventy years old uh, community ambulator? Uh, displaced distal radius fracture. How are we treating that in 2010 when the exam was written? That's a, it's a very good question, and there's that section on my talk at the Miller course, and if I gave all the answers now, no one would come to the course, but that's a great question, and to be honest, um, most people, if there's a high demand uh, a person, even if they're older, uh, volar plating is a very accepted and is becoming uh, used very frequently. Uh, there are complications associated with volar plating, uh, but there's there's also support for non-operative management uh, with a reasonable reduction in the older uh, population, old uh, geriatric population. So you really need to look at the level of activity of those individuals, uh, and if they're high demand people, as a lot of uh, a lot of uh, older people are with regard to hobbies and sports, uh, ORIF with volar plating for dorsally annulated osteoporotic fractures is becoming uh, the standard of care in, in many areas. Great. And a couple of questions from the audience. Uh, the first one is, is um, the Martin Gruber anastomosis, the Richie Canoe, uh, my favorite anastomosis, mm -hmm. um, are those uh, red herrings on the exam? Is there an easy way to remember what those are and uh, how to go through those, those sort of uh, anomalous nerve innervations? Sure. The Rich Canoe is rarely asked. The Martin Gruber is much more uh, frequently asked, but it's rare as well. There's a, much more, a better understanding of the seven different uh, Martin Gruber anastomoses or relationships, which is median and ulnar nerve crossovers in the forearm, uh, 
that's why you can have a median nerve laceration at the wrist if you have a crossover uh, more proximal in the forearm where median nerve fibers go to the ulnar nerve and then cross back over in the palm you can have an intact recurrent motor branch even though you swear that the nerve was cut uh, prior to you know at the wrist but wrist canoe is more sensory and motor crossovers in the palm itself and it's more sensory related but the more common uh, you should be familiar with Martin Gruber anastomosis which is present in 15 to 20 percent of people in its normal anatomy so the main point about those crossovers is that they can make your physical exam findings confusing uh, in terms of localizing a nerve lesion or nerve laceration and frequently exam findings may be confusing because of these uh, these uh, nerve uh, crossovers. Great. And, and last question. On the exam, do you need to remember the, um, for the distal fingertip uh, injuries, do you need to remember the flaps and how they're described or are they likely to be described by their eponymous terms? They're likely to be, so for instance, they'll be described by VY advancement flap or a Moberg flap. They're actually, but uh, they are often used by, described by their eponymous terms, um, but uh, normally it's fairly straightforward. They don't make it too complicated. Uh, they'll ask a question, uh, a musician has a fingertip amputation, what are your options? Replant the digit, VY advancement, uh, you know, um, uh, dressing changes, uh, or shortening and closure. Uh, so when you have examples like that, then it becomes pretty clear. And in that situation, a, a BY advancement works very well because it maintains length and gives you a nice sensate tip, even in a high-demand person such a, as a musician. Great. Well, thank you so much, Bobby. Really appreciate it. And next, it's great to, great to do this, and, and uh, it's quite fun. Thank you. thank you. Next, we'll be moving on to Ginger Holt. Uh, Ginger comes to us from uh, Vanderbilt. Uh, University where she was a uh, resident and uh, earned the nickname uh, Anatomic Ginger. She uh, has uh, strayed from that and came back up uh, to uh, Toronto here where she learned her uh, pathology and that's what she'll be talking to us about today. So Ginger, it's all yours. Thank you. Um, I, uh, there, there were some comments that were coming up and um, everything uh, you see tonight will be presented again at the Miller Review course. You get a thumb drive that has all of the uh, slides on it. About 450 of my color slides with all of the pathology will be on. You get this uh, sheet. So it's about a 10-page condensed uh, sheet for all of the orthopedic oncology um, problems. It's condensed for you to use in the days prior to your exam. I give you a cheat sheet. So there's a lot more that occurs at the uh, Miller Review course than this. Um, I'm giving you five uh, top uh, orthopedic oncologic um, conditions tonight instead of ten so that you uh, don't learn too much tonight. A, a big part of oncology is uh, learning pattern recognitions and so a lot of the questions ask you to um, recognize a tumor and then ask a question about it. So I think looking at general histology types can be very helpful uh, for you and remembering that the origins of the cells sort of shows you what the histology is so um, the parenchymal cell line of origin hematopoietic cell line of origin and mesenchymal cell line of origin are the three big cell lines that we uh, think about uh, carcinoma originates from the parenchymal cell line hematopoietic tumors lead to myeloma leukemia lymphoma and then sarcomas come from the mesenchymal cell line. And that becomes important when you look at these uh, histology pictures. On the left, when you think of the uh, cell origin, the uh, parenchymal cells like the heart, uh, pancreas, the, the solid organs, you see nests and glands of cells on your histology, and that is the, that parenchymal cell line. Hematopoietic tumors have very little stromal. They very much act like the marrow and uh, have discohesive cells. You can see in this slide in the center, uh, it almost looks like marrow. There are some fat globules throughout. And then when you look to the far right, the sarcoma, uh, being the mesenchymal cell origin, recapitulates muscle. And you can see the cigar-shaped nuclear cells, the very large bizarre cells, small cells, and the very abnormal cells. So 
uh, recognizing that uh, oncology is a very pattern-driven uh, field and looking at these pictures this is one great slide that really shows you three distinct uh, cell types, tumor types, and histology types. So for, for the top five, um, osteosarcoma is the most common malignant uh, uh, primary bone tumor. It occurs in a younger age group, so ages 5 to 30 being the most common bone sarcoma. There are multiple types. We aren't going to go into those uh, tonight, but we go over those at, at the review course and sort of what's important about each of them. If you see these lesions, they occur in the distal femur. Uh, proximal tibia sort of around the knee and then the proximal humerus is a, a second uh, and third common location. In recognizing these we talk about this hair on end pattern and this is describing how the bone forms along the tension and compression lines of bone. The uh, sunburst is also what is described with these. Um, so the, the sunburst is like the sun coming over the horizon, and you can see from the red arrows how those two mimic each other. And this is a very uh, classic finding for osteosarcoma, a skeletally immature patient, metaphyseal lesion, and this hair on end or sunburst pattern that you see. The histology is also quite characteristic. So the uh, top red arrow here shows you the osteoid or the immature bone. So you have collagen that doesn't have any uh, um, maturation to it. There's no calcification uh, prog progression going on. This is in comparison to the green star at the top of the slide that shows you mature bone. So it's a very nice comparison there to look at your woven uh, bone below and then the mature bone above. The uh, malignant rimming osteoblasts then uh, show you um, uh, make this a, a malignant process and if you look at the malignant cells uh, surrounding you can see that those are throughout the entire medullary space there so seeing immature bone the um, mature bone is a good uh, comparison here's another uh, skeletally immature patient metaphyseal lesion and all of the uh, uh, bone forming process going on when you look at this on a cross-sectional MRI image, you see the soft tissue mass is pushed outside. We have a large uh, periosteal reaction around this, and this is quite characteristic. A skeletally immature patient, metaphyseal lesion forming bone. And you hope when you turn the page that you see uh, your uh, immature woven osteoid with malignant rimming osteoblast. So the common question for oncology or pathology is that you're given all of this information and you are expected to make the diagnosis and then the questions are going to come at the end for you. So you're going to be expected to now know uh, what an osteosarcoma looks like by x-ray, by history, and the questions that are most commonly asked are what is the treatment? So they give you all this information and say what is the uh, best treatment for this patient? And remembering that osteosarcomas are best treated uh, with chemotherapy and surgery so they don't necessarily ask you uh, the specifics about the order or anything else, what they want to know is that you know it's chemotherapy and surgery, so some combination. Osteosarcomas have no genetic translocation, so uh, Ewing sarcoma, synovial sarcomas, there are a lot of sarcomas that have a genetic translocation that is associated with them. Uh, Ewing uh, sarcoma, but none for osteosarcoma. There is a genetic alteration in the retinoblastoma gene and the p53 tumor suppressor gene. So a question you may get is a uh, patient that has had retina, retinoblastoma in the past and then they show you all of the histology and slides and ask you uh, what the most common diagnosis may be. Uh, next uh, common tumor, the second most common bone sarcoma is a chondrosarcoma. This is going to occur in a, uh, an older population, at least uh, 40 to 50 or older, so it's a different age population to begin with. And chondrosarcomas uh, occur in the proximal femur, distal femur, proximal humerus and very commonly in the scapula and pelvis. So they occur in the flat bones and uh, the scapula and the pelvis are the two most common. You can see from this slide that the um, uh, bone has a very slow growth pattern. So you can see that the um, metaphyseal and metadaphyseal portion of the bone has a very slow progression. The arrows show you that this is a very slow process. That As the tumor pushes out against the bone, the bone has time to react. It pushes back against the bone and the bone pushes again and, and you can see that this has a, a very chronic pattern to it of growth. And that's very characteristic for chondrosarcomas. They're very slow growing. They can get very, very large.
uh, over time. We always look at the difference between a chondrosarcoma and an enchondroma, and the key uh, phrases or features that we use um, are punctate calcifications, arcs, and rings. You can see those in an enchondroma. The difference is, number one, patients have pain with a true chondrosarcoma, and number two, you see the endosteal scalloping, what we call the bone erosion, and again, that laboring process that the uh, cartilage pushed pushes against the bone, the bone pushes back, and there's a sort of a fight going on between the bone and the cartilage, and over time, the bone becomes deformed, telling you this has been a little bit of a, an ongoing process. lesion with arcs and rings in the scapula. Here's a great example of a chondrosarcoma in the scapula. And here's a great example in the pelvis. It is uh, very common to see multiple hereditary osteochondromatosis on the exam and the uh, lesion with a large cartilage cap in the pelvis is a chondrosarcoma until proven otherwise. The histology is characteristic. The uh, binucleate cells that you see the very high cellularity is very different. Cartilage around the knee or normal cartilage has very few cells within it. Uh, it's a lot of hyaline cartilage uh, with, with little cells and the high level of cellular, cellularity is characteristic for chondrosarcoma. Here's another picture, the binucleate cells, multiple cells, a lot of purple on the slides is usually the uh, color that you see. Uh, the degree of cellularity tells you if it's a grade one, two, or three. And again, uh, a low-grade chondrosarcoma and an enchondroma um, can be distinguished by the number of cells that occur. Peter must be having a seizure. So here's another um, uh, higher uh, grade picture. Here's a chondroid matrix. You can see all the binuclear cells in there that are characteristic. But when you look, you see mitotic figures. You see all the dark blue, the chromatin, telling you that this is a more malignant process. And again, the high degree of cellularity is important in determining uh, that this is a malignant lesion. Here's another picture, proximal humerus. You can see on the uh, left-hand side of the proximal humerus, the endosteal scalloping, the erosion. So this is not a plain old enchondroma. We have endosteal scalloping erosion. This patient is likely to have pain. On the left, the binucleate cells, high cellularity is very characteristic for chondrosarcoma. And when you get down to this, again, you're going to get the x-rays, the age, the histology. It's expected that you're going to know that that's a chondrosarcoma. The question is, how do you treat it? And different from other bone sarcomas, uh, the, your, your typical um, chondrosarcoma has um, treated with wide excision only. Not chemotherapy, no radiation, wide excision. So they're going to give you all the information, and your answer uh, for treatment is wide excision by surgery. Ewing sarcoma is always on the test, um, if not once, uh, twice. Again, a younger age population, typically in the diaphysis. We talk about diaphyseal lesions being a, uh, a mnemonic is A-E-I-O-U and sometimes Y. A-E-I-O-U and sometimes Y. The um, adamantinoma, eosinophilic granuloma or histiocytoma, infection, osteoarastioma, osteoblastoma, uh, Ewing sarcoma, and lymphoma. So when you think about a diaphyseal lesion and you run through your AEIOU, you should be able to narrow it down as to what it is. It's rare in African-American patients. It's the third most common uh, sarcoma of bone. Ewing sarcoma, for all intent and purpose, cannot be distinguished from an infection until you get the histology. So a very common confuser, confuser on the exam can be a patient who presents with a large pelvic lesion. They have a fever. They have an elevated ESR, CRP. X-ray may or may not have uh, significant changes, and they're going to give you histology, which makes the difference in the Ewing's versus infection. We unfortunately commonly see these things um, washed out, irrigated, debrided without pathology, assumed to be an infection, and it ends up being a Ewing sarcoma. The radiographs in the diaphyseal portion of the bone are very characteristic. We talk about onion skinning. We have a similar sunburst uh, type reaction. Sometimes people describe this as but the periosteal reaction is uh, very characteristic. And here's an example of that onion skinning. What happens is a Ewing sarcoma has a very large uh, nucleus, very little cytoplasm. The cells are discohesive. They don't stick together. And as they push through the haversian canal system, the periosteum reforms. The tumor pushes beyond the haversian system. The periosteum uh, heals again, and you get this onion scanning that occurs just like this onion appears. 
The MRI scans usually show you, show you very large soft tissue mass for that reason. The liquidy type tumor pushes out of the bone, periosteum, pushes out periosteum, and as that reaction occurs, we get a really big uh, uh, soft tissue mass. Here's a, a, an example again of that onion skinning that you see. This was a patient who uh, was just walking, stepped off, took a step, and uh, uh, a fracture occurred. The onion skinning you see nicely with the red arrows in this MRI scan it showed a very large soft tissue mass. Here again on the left shows you the, um, the cortical disrupt disruption and the, the, the lesion with a very large um, liquidy tumor, soft tissue mass. The most common presentation of a bone sarcoma is stage 2B in the endocrine system. A patient who has a cortical disruption, a soft tissue mass, but no lung lesions is a stage 2B, and this very commonly shows up on the exam. On the right, you see a Codman's triangle. Again, that same process of the tumor pushing out against the periosteum. The periosteum heals, and we begin to again, uh, get the periosteum lifted off of the edge of the bone, and a triangle forms. Viewing histology as characteristics is one of our small round blue cell tumors. We also like to tell you that the small round blue cell tumors you need to learn. So learn them, L-E-R-N-M, uh, lymphoma, Ewing's, rhabdomyosarcoma, neuroblastoma, and myeloma. Ewing's being one of those. Uh, you will not get a Ewing's without being told that there is uh, an 1122 translocation. We don't even treat patients anymore with chemo unless they have this translocation. Another finding is the uh, vimentin positivity, keratin, and CD99 positivity. Uh, and the 1122 translocation uh, uh, leads to a uh, gene transcription of the EWS fly1. So this may be asked in uh, different ways on the test, but it will uh, definitely be on there. If you didn't get that, I see the questions uh, coming up uh, for the diaphyseal bone lesions. A, E, I, O, U, and sometimes Y. A is adamantinoma. Uh, e is eosinophilic granuloma, also called eosinocytosis. I is infection. O is osteoblastoma or osteoblastoma. Uh, U we uh, use for Ewing sarcoma because we're simple. And uh, Y, sometimes Y, is uh, lymphoma. Again, a Ewing sarcoma, a very big lesion in the pelvis. You can see this lesion uh, mimics an infection in the sacroiliac joint. You have expansion into the iliacus, expansion of the gluteus medius minimus maximus. This can very easily be confused with an infection by all parameters. The histology is the key for you. Small round blue cell tumor, 1122 translocation. Treatment for Ewing sarcoma is, is uh, the same as osteosarcoma, chemotherapy and surgery in combination. Um, the, remember the treatment for chondrosarcoma is surgery only. Ewing sarcoma, again, somewhere either in the stem to lead you to the answer, uh, but more commonly you're going to get the uh, x-rays, MRI scan, histology, and the question for you is either what uh, genetic trans what uh, translocation is associated or what genetic transcription factor comes from that. Metastatic disease is the most common bone disease uh, uh, in malignancy that we see, and it will be on your test. You will see it in practice, and the, the questions for metastatic disease center around your being a safe practitioner. Uh, the common osteophiles, prostate, thyroid, breast, lung, kidney, PT Barnum likes kids is the mnemonic we like to use. We also commonly include lymphoma and myeloma with that because they act like metastatic disease. As we discussed earlier, they do have a different cell of origin, uh, being uh, hematopoietic as opposed to parenchymal like prostate, thyroid, breast, lung, kidney, so they're easier to differentiate on histology. So when you see a patient on your exam and they are 55 years old or greater, they have a lytic lesion, it is metastatic disease until proven otherwise. And how do you prove that? To find the uh, primary lesion, a CT scan of the chest, abdomen, and pelvis in greater than 85% of cases will find the lesion for you. Um, and that goes with the osteophiles. Whole body bone scan is more important for uh, staging for you to see if there are other lesions. 
And then there are your disease-specific tests like a PSA for prostate, a breast exam or mammogram for breast cancer, uh, and so forth. Uh, the most important thing for metastatic bone disease, and uh, any time you uh, see this, a biopsy and making a diagnosis is important. The uh, radiographs um, show a lytic destructive lesion, and when you see a lesion in the hand or foot, lesions distal to the elbow, uh, lung is the most common source. Lung cancer is the most common cancer that occurs in the United States today, so by volume, it's most likely that it is the answer when, when you're asked what is most common for metastatic lesions. But you may get a lesion in the hand that uh, is a lytic destructive lesion, and you're asked what is the next, next best test to evaluate the patient and knowing that either a chest x-ray or a CT scan of the chest to evaluate the lungs is how that question comes to you. Uh, renal cell carcinoma is the uh, second. The, the histology again is characteristic. Uh, nests, glands make up the uh, carcinomas. They commonly are seen abutting mature bone. So if you see here the top green arrow shows you um, the leading edge of the uh, nest down there of uh, cohesive cells recapitulating a gland and then uh, along that edge for both the green arrows is where that is eating into the bone and that is mature bone again. You see the mature lamellar lines, the lacunae and all of the uh, mature bone being eaten by this lytic uh, destructive aggressive lesion. So uh, uh, the biggest and most important thing for a uh, lytic lesion is making the diagnosis and that commonly leads to a biopsy. So only nail or fix, so on your exam, only nail or fix a lesion when you have a diagnosis. Always biopsy before you take a metastatic patient to surgery. Uh, the uh, progression of how you get your test is not necessarily important, but knowing that you need to systemically stage a patient before you act on it or take them to surgery. And if you look back at the exams, uh, when, it, when you have an older patient, a lytic bone lesion, and you're given the option to biopsy the lesion, and your test answer uh, possibilities, biopsy is on there, always choose biopsy because it's always going to be the answer. Uh, this, unfortunately, was a patient on the right here who had an osteosarcoma. Uh, uh, he never had a biopsy. He got assumed it was metastatic, had a nail. When he never, ever healed, he got this uh, um, a lesion finally biopsied two months later, and he had to have a hindquarter amputation because of iatrogenic contamination. Now, the guys who make out the tests are very, very passionate about making sure that you biopsy and appropriately treat a metastatic lesion that you don't take them to surgery before you know the diagnosis. So the last uh, thing I'm going to talk with you about is giant cell tumor. Again, this is one that always shows up on the test. It has many classic characteristic features. Um, so uh, giant cell tumors occur typically in the epiphyseal portion of the bone. It's in skeletally mature patients. Remember, chondroblastomas are epiphyseal lesions in skeletally immature patients. So a, a skeletally mature patient with a, an epiphyseal lesion, think giant cell tumor, the most common are in the distal femur. They secondarily occur in the proximal tibia, proximal humerus, and uh, in other locations. Because only 5% um, uh, or less metastasize, they are not considered malignant. They are only considered locally aggressive. The radiographs show a lytic lesion. It's usually, as we discussed, epiphyseal. It can be epiphyseal metaphyseal in skeletally mature patients with an associated soft tissue mass. Here's an example of another giant cell tumor. You see on the left, a uh, lytic destructive lesion that uh, crosses the physeal scar. So it is epiphyseal, although it extends into the metaphysis. And then when you look at the lesion on the MRI scan, there it is, uh, confirming your x-ray findings. The pathology is characteristic for a giant cell tumor. And what's pathognomonic, you see the top arrow, the, the nuclei in the giant cell appear the same as the nuclei in the stroma. And many times you cannot even tell the difference between uh, the, the nuclei in the giant cell or where there are even any giant cells. The cells all look the same. There can be aneurysmal degeneration that occurs. So an aneurysmal bone cyst in giant cell tumor can occur in concert. Uh, a lot of times people ask, you know, is it going to be on the test? How do these get reconstructed? Is it bone graft? Is it cement? What do we do? And the, uh, uh, that is very controversial amongst people. The important thing is to know that this does not need 
uh, resection with a megaprosthesis or some other big resection, but an intralesional resection, curatage, and fixation. And that'll be the answer on their fixation, not any uh, specific type. The results or the recurrence rate purely depends on the, res on the resection. It doesn't matter if you put uh, dirt or whatever you want to in these. Uh, it's not the reconstruction, it's how you take the tumor out. And a, and a really important thing to remember is that uh, just because you see a giant cell does not mean it's a giant cell tumor. So you need to see the pathognomonic stromal cells. Giant cells can occur in many things. Aneurysmal bone cysts, chondroblastomas, fractures, a giant cell rich osteosarcoma. So uh, use all of your clues, but don't immediately turn. See a giant cell and immediately assume a uh, giant cell tumor. And if you look at this picture, this is a perfect histological uh, picture. You almost can't tell where the giant cells are and where the uh, stromal cells are. Uh, good luck to you guys on the test. Uh, again, we will go through these things and many more at the review course. If you have questions, I think uh, Patrick has been answering them throughout. Yep, he has. Thank you very much. Yep, Thank so the you, best uh, adjuvant Patrick for bone grafting, well. uh, again, is arguable. It is not what adjuvant you use. It is opening up the lesion and performing an adequate curatage. And that may uh, come down to be the answer on the test, an adequate, appropriate exposure and curatage, uh, not whether it's phenol, liquid nitrogen, uh, magic fairy dust, vancomycin powder, or whatever else. So, Ginger, just a couple of questions here. I'd be remiss if I didn't mention uh, osteosarcoma and uh, the impact that that's had up here with Terry Fox and his ability to raise a lots of money with uh, <clears throat> his research uh, funds in the walk. So what with regards to osteosarcoma, I think all of us now understand how to treat it. But can you go through a little bit more detail how to work up the patient prior to initiating treatment? So once you've got the diagnosis, if the question on the exam is, what is the most following next step in the uh, management of this patient? Um, could you answer that question for us? So a patient with osteosarcoma? So you've made the diagnosis on the histology within yep. the question, and um, what is your staging protocol? How are you going through to make sure that uh, they may not have metastatic disease? What do you need to initiate before you fully initiate treatment? Yep. So uh, as we discussed with the different uh, tumor types, the most common location for metastatic disease is the chest. So uh, it is a bit controversial these days whether a PET scan in pediatric patients or bone scan is necessary. So a CT scan of the chest is the next best step in uh, managing a patient for staging. So it's always important to differentiate staging versus diagnosis. Um, the uh, next best step for uh, staging uh, is either a bone scan or PET CT scan, and those are two um, uh, controversial for that to be the answer. So most commonly the test question and answer is for a CT scan of the chest. Right. And what regard today is limb salvage versus amputation? Is one preferred over the other yet? The uh, standard currently is limb salvage. In probably about 95% of cases limb salvage is a standard of care. It is now even uh, too controversial in the setting of a pathologic fracture, but even in that setting, people still argue that um, limb salvage surgery can be uh, 95% of cases, limb salvage surgery. And one last question. I think a lot of the audience is having uh, some difficulty with approaching the more soft tissue tumors. Uh, you know, your synovial sarcomas, your epithelioid sarcomas, your MFH, those sorts of things, the list seems to be endless. If you could clue in our audience to uh, what you think are the most important, can't miss, soft tissue sarcomas, what would they be? Yes, uh, you mentioned synovial sarcoma is the most common uh, tested tumor because of the uh, genetic translocation, the SYT translocation that occurs with it. Uh, and I go over this and we, in the course we have all the, the slides that show you that soft tissue sarcomas are essentially the same. They are treated with uh, surgical resection and radiation therapy. 
The only thing that differentiates them is their histology. Their appearance on an MRI scan is the same. Their appearance clinically is the same. The histology and looking at the uh, microscopic evaluation is the only thing that differentiates them. The, uh, uh, a common one that is tested or questions come up on will be synovial sarcoma. And uh, for any um, genetic evaluation, you can remember the translocation that, that is becoming more and more common uh, on the tests. But you Great. Know, what well, you thank you very the much. Basic, the thank basics, uh, surgery radiation. Great. Thank you. Uh, and now we have, uh, without further ado, Derek. Derek, are you on? Yeah, sorry about that. I got kicked out for a second. Okay, Can well, without me? further ado, Derek Moore. Sorry about that. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can hear you fine, Derek. Okay. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the spine. Uh, according to the ABOS, uh, spine is going to make up approximately 8% of the entire test. Uh, on OrthoBullets, we use a breakdown based on the OIT questions for the last eight years. And based on our breakdown, spine also composes about 8% of the test. Look here, this is a list of the top 25 topics that are going to appear on the spine. About 50% of these are lumbar, and about 50% of these are cervical. Today I'm going to focus on the cervical spine, and the reason I think this is a uh, a really a strategic area where you can get a lot of bang for your buck. The reason for this is cervical spine kind of lays on the periphery of orthopedic surgery. So a lot of these questions tend to be very easy. In addition, if you look at this breakdown here, over 50% of the questions on the cervical spine in the last five years covered only three topics. So if you have a good grasp of these three topics, spinal cord injuries, cervical myelopathy, and cervical radiculopathy, the chances are you're going to do very well on the test. So, so tonight I'm just going to talk about these top four topics, spinal cord injuries, cervical myelopathy, cervical radiculopathy, and a dontoid fracture. So cervical myelopathy is the second most commonly tested uh, topic in the cervical spine. What I want you to note here is in the last eight years, 10 of the questions on cervical myelopathy have been on treatment. So you need to know how to treat cervical myelopathy. So cervical myelopathy is caused by compression of the spinal cord. It's char characterized by clumsiness in the hands and gait imbalance. The most common cause of it is cervical spondylotic myelopathy. However, other common causes include trauma, tumor, epidural abscess, and in the Asian countries, OPLL. Typical symptoms are numbness and tingling in the hands. Keywords you want to recognize in the question stem is that these symptoms are often bilateral and non-dermal tomal. These patients also complain of decreased hand dexterity. So things you want to identify in the question stem are uh, difficulty buttoning shirts or frequently dropping objects. These patients also frequently have gait instability or usually have gait instability. So in the question stem, you're going to look for some keywords including uh, bumping into walls or difficulty with stairs. Uh, the reason I like treating cervical myelopathy is you can make the diagnosis confident, uh, confidently based on physical exam alone. You're going to look for decreased hand function and weakness. On physical exam, the things you're going to look for are interosseous wasting and a positive grip and release test. They're also going to have the classic signs of spasticity. So things you want to look for are patellar hyperreflexivity, a positive Hoffman sign, positive clonus, positive Vinci test. These patients also have gait imbalance. So you always, on physical exam, you always want to do a gait analysis, have them walk toe to heel. If they're myelopathic, they're going to be unable to walk toe to heel. Uh, there's two classification systems you need to be familiar with, the neuroclassification system and the Japanese Orthopedic Association. The neuroclassification is very simple. It's based entirely on lower extremity function. So grade five, they're wheelchair bound. Grade four, they require a cane. Grade three, they can walk, but they can't work. The key differentiation between the neuroclassification and the Japanese Orthopedic Association is that the Japanese Orthopedic Association, which is a much more complex system based on 18 points in the scoring system, 
is based on the function of both the upper and lower extremities. Imaging studies, radiographs, and CT uh, in this age population, you're going to see a lot of degenerative changes. Uh, the most important part of these studies is you want to look for the kyphotic alignment, and that's going to be critical when you decide your treatment. To determine the sagittal alignment, you measure two angles, the C2 to C7 kyphotic alignment, as well as the local kyphosis angle. MRI is really going to be the study that's going to guide your treatment. What you're looking for is spinal cord compression. This manifests in two ways, either CSF effacement or myomalacia. So on your T2 sagittal images, C CSF is this bright white stuff surrounding the spinal cord. It's fluid, and therefore, if you compress the spinal cord, you're going to preferentially compress out or efface the CSF, and that's what we're seeing here where you lose that nice white line. The other thing you're going to look for is myomalacia. Myomalacia is the signal intensity within the substance of the spinal cord, and you can see some here as well. Uh, it's very important to understand the natural history of cervical myelopathy. It basically progresses forward and very rarely improves without non-operative management. We also know that the severity of the symptoms when you treat the patient determine their ultimate outcome. What this means is you want, you want to identify cervical myelopathy early and treat it early in order to optimize the chances of having good outcome with surgery. Therefore, your indications for surgery are progressive symptoms and physical exam findings of myelopathy or MRI findings of cord signal changes. So when you, when you uh, talk about treatment for cervical myelopathy, there's uh, two things you want to ask. One, is the patient kyphotic? Whenever there's more than 10 degrees of kyphosis, you have to go anterior. This illustration shows why. Normally, the cervical, cervical spine is lordotic or neutral, and this puts the spinal, canal, the spinal cord right in the middle of the spinal canal. This shows if the patient becomes kyphotic, what happens is you pull the spinal cord anteriorly, so it drapes over the anterior compressive elements. Now, if you look here, if we went ahead and did a posterior decompression, this would do little or nothing to actually decompress the spinal cord when it's being pulled forward over these anterior compressive elements. And that is why in these patients that are kyphotic, you need to go anterior first. And what this does is it brings the patient back to a neutral or lordotic alignment and brings the spinal cord away from those anterior compressive elements. You can do this with a single level corpectomy, a multi-level ACDF, a hybrid construct, or you can co combine it with a posterior decompression. You can do a two-level corpectomy, but it's very important to know that whenever you do a two-level corpectomy, you have to augment this with a posterior stabiliz stabilization. The reason is there's a very high percentage of graft dislodgement if you do it anterior alone, and this can lead to severe complications, including death. The second question you want to ask when uh, deciding how to treat cervical myelopathy is how many levels are compressed. So this is kind of a grid, kind of one way to approach these questions. Uh, they're going to ask, they're going to give you a clinical situation. They're going to ask you what is treatment. And there's basically going to be three different answers. You're either going to go anterior alone, posterior alone, which will include a laminoplasty or a laminectomy infusion, or you're going to both go anterior and posterior. And based on asking these two questions, is the patient kyphotic and how many levels of compression there are, you can choose between these three answers very easily. And as I said in the past, the majority of the cervical myelopathy questions have been asking which one of these three treatment approaches you should take. Let's try to put this to use. Here is an x-ray on the left. You can see that this patient is relatively neutral in terms of the sagittal alignment. If you look at the MRI, there is CSF effacement in myomalacia at one level. So there's one level of compression. So therefore, you're going to treat this with an anterior approach. And in this patient, we did an ACDF. Another example, again, the first thing you want to do is determine, is the patient kyphotic? This patient is neutral as well. Then you want to look at your sagittal T2 MRI and decide how many levels of compression there are. Here you can see there's CSF effacement in myomalacia at two levels of compression. So based on using this system, once again, 
you would do an anterior alone approach. In this patient, we did a one-level corpectomy. Another example, once again, this patient is neutral in alignment. But if you look at the MRI, this time you can see that there's CSF placement at, a, at at least three different levels. And a lot of this compression is coming from infolded ligamentum flavum posteriorly. So in this situation, you have three levels of compression. So here you would go posterior, and that's what we did. We did a posterior laminectomy and fusion. Purpose of this test, if you ever see an answer which is laminectomy alone, never choose it. Due to the risk of post laminectomy kyphosis. On this exam, you never want to do a laminectomy alone, and you always want to do a laminectomy combined with an instrumented fusion. Here's the final example. In this situation, you can see that the patient is kyphotic, has approximately 15 degrees of kyphosis. At your MRI, you can see there's CSF effacement at more than three levels, so there's three levels of compression. So in this situation, you're going to want to go anterior and posterior. Again, the reason you go anterior is to try to restore the neutral or lordotic alignment, as you can see has been done. In terms of complications of cervical myelopathy, uh, they've asked C5 palsy three times in the last eight years. The C5, C5 palsy is notoriously associated with a laminoplasty. However, you can also see it with a laminectomy and even anterior procedures. The next topic we're going to talk about is cervical radiculopathy. Uh, you can see here that all 10 questions in the last eight years have either been on physical exam or complication. So again, this is a very easy topic to get your answers correct. Cervical radiculopathy is caused by nerve root compression in the cervical spine. Two main causes, either cervical spondylosis, which leads to degenerative changes of the facet and oncovertebral joint, which leads to pyramidal stenosis. The second cause is a soft disc herniation. The nerve root effect is always below uh, the affected level. So if you have a C5-6 disc, the C6 nerve root is going to If you have a C6-7 disc, the C6, the C7 nerve root is going to be affected. Symptoms, uh, these patients usually present with arm pain. The key words you want to recognize in the question stem is that it's unilateral and often relieved by arm elevation. These patients also have numbness and paresthesias, and this is usually in a dermal tomo distribution. So you look carefully at the stem. If the patient has numbness and tingling in the thumb, you want to be thinking a C6 radiculopathy. If they have numbness and tingling in the second, third, or fourth fingers, you want to be thinking a C7 radiculopathy. Half the questions on cervical radiculopathy in the last eight years have been on the physical exam. So you need to know these motor levels by heart. C5 is deltoid and biceps. C6 is thumb, brachioradialis, wrist extension, and wrist supination. C7 is the second, third, and fourth fingers, triceps, wrist flexion, and wrist pronation. Uh, reflexes are, normal, normally are normal or decreased with cervical radiculopathy. With the trend or the current use of videos, you want to be familiar with the Sperling test and how that is performed. And also, you want to know that with cervical radiculopathy, if you elevate the arm, oftentimes this relieves the symptoms, and that's been tested twice. Our radiographs for cervical radiculopathy on the lateral, you're going to see your degenerative changes. Uh, one useful view is your oblique, and that's because you have a good look at the foramen. This x-ray is an oblique view, and you can see on top you have a foramen which is patent, where on the two levels below you can see a small osteophyte due to vertebral osteophyte formation. This would lead to foraminal stenosis. Uh, uh, for cervical radiculopathy, your go-to image is going to be your two t T2 axial image on your MRI. And what you're looking for here is a disc osteophyte complex with compression of the nerve root as it enters the foramen. Be aware that there's a high rate of false positives on MRIs. 28% uh, of people older than the age of 40 who have positive findings of either foraminal stenosis or a herniated disc. Natural history of cervical radic radiculopathy is very different than cervical myelopathy. In this situation, 75% of the patients get better with non-operative management alone. Modalities you want to include are just time, medications which include NSAIDs, steroids, gabapentin, or physical therapy. 
indications for surgery are persistent and disabling pain for more than 6 to 12 weeks or progressive and significant weakness. And what we mean by significant is that patients can't put a plate up in a cabinet or their laborer and they keep dropping objects with their dominant hand. Really only three treatment options for cervical radiculopathy. That's an ACDF, a cervical disc replacement, and a posterior foraminotomy. Both the cervical disc replacement and posterior foraminotomy are somewhat controversial and have never showed up on this test. That means the only real treatment is ACDF, so they can't ask you what the proper treatment is. So instead what they ask you is complications associated with an ACDF. And they've asked four questions on that in the past. Complications include pseudoarthrosis. Uh, if it's asymptomatic, observe it. If it's symptomatic, either treat it with a posterior cervical fusion or repeat ACDF with tricortical iliac crest bone graft. The other thing they like to ask is recurrent laryngeal nerve injury. Uh, if you get one, watch it for six weeks. If it doesn't get better at six weeks, send the patient to ENT. But what's more important to realize about recurrent laryngeal nerve injury is in revision surgery. Most individuals can tolerate a unilateral recurrent laryngeal nerve injury to have some change in voice, but they'll be fine. But they, what, what they cannot tolerate is a bilateral recurrent laryngeal nerve injury, which would basically leave you unable to speak. So if somebody had previous cervical surgery on the left and the recurrent laryngeal nerve injury was injured, the last thing you want to do is a revision surgery on the right and take out the other side. So whenever you have suspicion, whenever somebody has had prior cervical surgery and you're planning on doing a revision case and there's any suspicion of recurrent laryngeal nerve injury, the answer on the test and in practice is to send him for an ENT consult and to confirm the diagnosis and make sure that he doesn't have a, a, a palsy on one side. We also like to test hypoglossal nerve injury. Just remember that the tongue would deviate to the side of the injury. Uh, Horner syndrome caused from an injury to the sympathetic chain often shows up on the test. Remember that this will likely happen at the C6 level where the sympathetic chain most closely approximates the midline. This presents with the classic symptoms of ptosis, anhidrosis, and meiosis. Dysphagia is very common um, and also a single level ACDF is not a contraindication to play as we know from Peyton Manning. The next topic we're going to talk about is spinal cord injury. This is the most commonly tested concept in the cervical spine and in spine in general, so you need to know this very well. Most of the questions are on treatment or on the diagnosis of this condition. So motor vehicle accidents are the most common cause of spinal cord injuries. Uh, they estimate that there's a 3 to 25 percent chance that the spinal cord injury actually occurs after the traumatic episode due to improper transport. So be sure you transport these patients properly on the test, rigid collar, firm spine board, and standard log roll techniques. For athletes with a suspected cervical spine injury with helmets and shoulder pads on, leave the helmet and shoulder pad on until the patient arrives at the hospital or an experienced personnel can remove the physical exam for spinal cord injuries, again know those levels, C5, C6, and C7. You always want to perform a rectal exam to see if there's any rectal tone. With regard to the sensory level, uh, do check for perianal sensation. If there is sacral sparing, this is a good sign and it means it's an incomplete injury. You want to check for reflexes. Uh, in the acute situation, people are usually not spastic. Usually spasticity occurs about 72 hours and slowly progresses over time, but in the very acute situation, people with spinal cord injuries are not spastic. It's very important to check for their bulbal cavernosis reflex. The uh, reason for this is you need to evaluate for spinal shock. So spinal shock is a temporary loss of spinal cord function and reflexes below the level of injury. It usually lasts for about 24 to 72 uh, two hours after the spinal cord injury, characterized by paralysis, hypotonia, and a reflexivity. Cardiovascularly, you'll see bradycardia and hypotension. And again, it's characterized by an absent bulbal cavernosis reflex. The importance of spinal shock is that you cannot evaluate somebody's spinal neurologic injury until spinal shock is resolved. So you need to wait for the bulbal cavernosis reflex to return 
and then you perform your level and you'll get your final, um, final neurologic injury pattern. Studies for spinal cord injuries, you want to get radiographs and a CT scan. These are primarily important for uh, evaluating the structural stability of the spine and looking for any type of bony compression. Your MRI is really going to be your most valuable study. Once again, here you're looking for uh, spinal cord compression, which is best manifested as either CSF effacement or myomalacia. Here you can see on this x ray, this patient has, I mean, on this T2 sagittal MRI, the patient has a disc that leads to both CSF effacement and myomalacia, which is that white signal intensity in the sub. need to be familiar with the Asia classification. Um, everybody pictures that Asia image with all the boxes you have to fill out and is intimidated by it. But the truth, it's very simple. Just on a piece of paper, write down A, B, C, D, E. Remember E, as strong as an Asian elephant, these patients are normal. Opposite A, absolutely no motor or sensory. Halfway in between, 50% of the muscles are less than grade 3. What this means is that the patient is unable to lift his legs off the table or off the, exam off the bed. And from there, you can figure out the other two. In addition, you have to determine the functional level. Now remember, this is a functional level. People often get this confused. So what you're measuring is the last level that is functioning. So if a patient has a C5 level, that means the patient has intact deltoid and biceps. And let me ask you a question. If he has intact deltoid and biceps, can he feed himself? He can bring his hand or the back of his hand up to his mouth, but he doesn't have C6, so he can't wrist extend, and he can't supinate, so he can't bring his fingers to his mouth and feed himself. And this is why you see a dramatic difference in the function between a C5 level and a C6 level. Levels, patients are able to feed themselves, they can live independently, they can drive a wheelchair, wheelchair, they can actually even drive a car. This is very different than a C5 level. In terms of treatment of spinal cord injuries, uh, spinal dose st steroids, very controversial. The only thing you really need to know is the absolute contraindications. This includes uh, greater than eight hours has passed since the time of the injury, a gunshot wound where the patient is pregnant. All, all the other patients, almost all of these patients get undergo surgery, both, and that's for both incomplete and complete injuries. The reason is you want to stabilize the spine to facilitate, facilitate rehabilitation. In addition, you want to decompress the level just to optimize the chances of having a return of function at the level of the injury. The exception to this is gunshot wounds. They're usually treated non-operatively. The reason for this is the spine is usually structurally intact and there's no ongoing compression of the spinal cord because the bullet goes in and out. The exception to this is a bullet that's passed through the colon and remains in the spinal canal. That, that bullet is contaminated and needs to be removed. Complications of spinal cord injury, you need to be familiar with them because they can kill patients. Uh, decubitus ulcers lead to sepsis and death. Uh, treatment is really prevention. Venous thromboembolism, 100% of these patients will get a DVT if they're not on pharmacologic DVT prophylaxis. So all these patients need to be on DVT prophylaxis. Another complication that has been tested is autonomic dysreflexia. This is potentially fatal. It presents with headache, agitation, and hypertension caused by unchecked visceral stimulation or disimpact the patient. Another common cause of death is urosepsis. This is prevented by strict antiseptic uh, catheter techniques and don't let the bladder become overdistended. And finally, as has been tested in the past, is major depressive disorder, high incidence of about 11%. These patients can commit suicide, so if they have a major depressive disorder, they need to be treated. So, uh, I know we're a little bit over time, but we'll just go through this last topic quickly, which is odontoid fractures. The important thing to notice here is that uh, all four questions in the past have been focused on how to treat odontoid fractures. So odontoid fractures it comes in a bimodal distribution. It's caused by low energy falls in the elderly. Usually they hit their head. And it's also caused by high energy accidents in young patients. Patients usually present with neck pain alone. 
it's very rare that they have any neurologic deficits, so they usually just have neck different types of odontoid fractures, and you have to be very familiar with these as treatment is based on one is just an avulsion of the tip, a type two is a fracture at the waist, and a type three is a fracture in the body. X-rays that you want to get, you want to get a lateral x-ray to determine which type you have. Here's a lateral film, and you can see that the fracture pattern goes through the body. You can see that this fracture line is well below the anterior arch C1, so we know that this is a, uh, a type. This is the open mouth odontoid view, which is another radiographic view you want to obtain. Here you can see a fracture line also extending down into the body, so this is once again a type 3. Is really your study of choice for fracture delineation. Here you see a fracture line just below the anterior ring of C1, so we know this is the neck, so this is a type fracture. Here you see the fracture line actually well below the anterior ring of C1, so this is going through the body, so we know that this is a type 3 fracture pattern. MRIs are not very useful because usually these patients do not have any significant neurologic compression uh, and no neurologic deficits. So in terms of treatment of odontoid fractures, you want to break them down into four types. You want to break them down into type 1, type 2 young, type 2 elderly, and type 3. And this is based down, uh, divided into non-operative treatment and operative treatment. Operative treatment basically consists of a posterior C1-2 fusion. It is possible to do an anterior screw osteosynthesis, but that has not shown up in the test in the past, and I think it's unlikely to appear on the boards. Type 1 and 3, treatment is very easy, an external orthosis. There's no data to show whether an external orthosis is better than a halo, so they're not going to ask you to choose between the two. Type 2 is a little more difficult. The reason for this is that elderly patients do not tolerate a halo. Remember for this exam, never put an elderly patient in a halo. There's a very high mortality rate associated with that. The other reason type 2 treatment is a little more complex is there's a high non-union rate, um, approximately, it's approximately 30 uh, percent. You need to know what the risk factors for non-union are. Essentially it's displacement, angulation, older age in the patient, or a delay in treatment. So uh, treatment of type 2 in young patients, if it's non-displaced, you treat them in a halo. If it's displaced, you treat them with surgery, either a posterior C12 fusion or an anterior screw osteosynthesis. Elderly patient, if they're operative candidates, you go ahead with the same uh, surgical treatment as we just discussed. If they're not surgical patients, you treat them in a soft collar. Again, the take home message is you never put an elderly patient in a halo. Let's just go through some examples here. We have a 27-year-old motor vehicle accident. He's Asia E, strong as an Asian elephant, which means he's normal. You see on the x-rays, you can see a type 3 odontoid fracture pattern. This is seen both on the lateral and the open mouth odontoid. So again, type 3, whether the patient's young or old, you treat him with an external orthosis. If the patient's old, you, don't, old, you do not put him in a halo. Another case. Here you have a 46-year-old who was involved in a motor vehicle accident two weeks ago. He has neck pain. He's neurologically intact or Asia E. Here on your CT scan, you see the fracture pattern is just below the anterior ring of C1, so you know that this is a, a type 2 odontoid fracture. It's a young patient, and it's displaced, so what is treatment? You treat him with surgery, either posterior C1 fusion or anterior screw. The two treatment options for your posterior C12 fusion are either construct using C1 lateral mass screws and C2 pedicle screws, as are shown here. This is what that x-ray will look like. The alternative is to do a C1 transarticular screw construct, as illustrated here, and as seen by this x-ray. Here's another patient. Now you have a 72-year-old woman, so you have an elderly woman. She falls. She presents with neck pain. She's very active, she drives, she cooks, she gardens. So here would be surgery. In this situation, you could do an anterior screw osteosynthesis. I don't think this is going to show up on the test, 
but if it does, the likely things that they're going to ask is that it's only indicated a type 2 fracture path, a type 2 odontoid fracture, and you can only do it when the fracture line is perpendicular to the trajectory of the screw. Here's the last case, same patient, 72-year-old neck pain, uh, but this patient has a history of a stroke. She's wheelchair bound. So here you want to proceed with non-operative treatment. Again, you never put an elderly patient in a halo, so you treat her in a soft collar. Uh, so that's pretty much it for me. I'm sorry we went over. Uh,